Welcome to Lecture 4 of ECE 4305 Software Defined Radio Systems and Analysis. In this lecture, we will focus on the critical components of the Software Defined Radio System that enables the translation between the digital information and analog waveforms with an emphasis on sampling theory. We'll then look at how the USRP platform handles the conversion between the analog and digital domains of this information. So we can summarize the variety of different types of signals out there into three basic categories. There are analog signals, which possess a continuum of time and amplitude values, such as voltage, current, and temperature readings. There are digital signals that are discrete valued in both the time and amplitude domains, such as um, number of students within a class, or a signal that has been converted into a digital representation with a finite number of amplitude values at a finite number of time instances. Finally, there is something called discrete time signals, which possess discrete time instances of values, but those values can assume a continuum of possible numbers. Uh, so for instance, um, the hourly change in temperature in the, in the, in the city of Worcester. What we are interested in in, in, in in this lecture in particular is the translation between digital signals and analog signals, since um, baseband functionality on a software-defined radio is entirely digital, but uh, we wish to communicate information from one, uh, one, one individual, one radio platform, the transmitter, to some distant receiver um, through an air medium, and this can be accomplished using the hardware we have entirely in the analog domain. So we need some sort of mathematical tool set, if you will, in order to be able to convert from the digital information that we're, we're um, processing and creating and manipulating and treating in, in the software-defined radio baseband functionality, and then convert it to these analog signs and cosine waveforms that we uh, create and broadcast over the air that, that, that then get intercepted by a receiver and then are converted back into the digital domain and digital information that uh, can be interpreted at the receiver end. So in order to do uh, this conversion between the analog and digital and digital and analog domains, we absolutely need to have a solid foundation in sampling theory. Okay? So first things first, uh, we're going to assume in, in this course that um, we're going to uh, assume the most common form of sampling, which is periodic sampling. That is, um, if, if we have some sort of analog waveform, some continuous signal, that um, every t seconds for a fixed t, we take the value of that signal and we, we, we input that into the, the digital domain. So what we do is we, we, every t seconds we take a value, take a value, take a value, take a value, rather than the continuum of values available by the continuous waveform. Okay? And the goal is we go from continuous signal representation to a discrete time uh, signal representation. So we have a discrete number of values, although those values until we quantize them later on, um, can still assume a, a continuum, an infinite continuum of representations. So mathematically, this looks like the, the following here. Uh, X of n is equal to Xc and t. So what does this mean? Well, X of n, especially, you know, note the uh, uh, square brackets here. X of n, uh, what that represents is our discrete time signal. What this means is, um, uh, X is our, our, our signal, and N is the time index. So X of 1 is the value of X at time instant, discrete time instant 1. Um, X of 2 is the discrete time signal value at N equals 2, time instant 2, and so on and so forth. And XC is the continuous time signal representation, and what we're doing is um, we have this this, this index n, and what n does is it, it multiplies against some constant sampling period t, which is in seconds. So what we essentially have is, uh, assuming n is an integer value, every t seconds we pick off a value and input it into x of n from xc of n t. Okay. Um, 1 over big t, 
This gives us something called the sampling frequency, and usually that's represented in hertz. Okay, and there we also represent the sampling frequency in radians per second. And so um, uh, the sampling frequency, we can either have it as in representation of f of s or big omega, as we can see here. So it's either hertz or radians per second, depending on um, uh, one's preference. Okay. So in general, uh, what happens is, um, although we, uh, you know, uh, we, we like to uh, do the conversion from a continuous time signal to a discrete time signal. Um, normally, digital, uh, digital processors, microprocessor systems, uh, cannot work with an um, infinite number of possible values for every discrete time sample. We have to quantize it. We have to limit the number of possible values that that sample can be. And that's the conversion between the discrete time and digital domains. And what happens is we use something called an analog to digital converter in order to accomplish this. Okay, so as a result, we have quantized time values, and those time values have quantized amplitude values, a finite number of representations, because then from that we can assign a binary representation to each one of those amplitude values. In general, we don't have, um, uh, uh, like, you know, when we do sampling, we cannot necessarily be guaranteed that we can ex recover from that discrete time representation or um, digital representation the original continuous time signal okay so 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 note to oneself um, uh, this process may not be re reversible in general however we do have several rules that uh, enable us to, if we ever do sample a signal, there are some conditions and rules that we can follow such that we can potentially perfectly reconstruct an analog waveform, a continuous time waveform, back from its discrete time representation. Okay. And so let's, uh, so, so what we're going to do now is go through an example of how do we, um, in a graphical sense, uh, perform this sampling. And the trick is, uh, because we're going to be using this later on and throughout the rest of this course, we're going to be using a combination of an impulse train modulator. And I'll show you what I mean in, in a minute. And we're going to show how we're going to use this impulse train modulator in order to convert a continuous time signal into, first of all, discrete time representation, followed by potentially uh, a digital representation. So let's show how we do analog to digital conversion. Okay. So suppose we have a signal and it's a continuous time signal, X of T, right? All right. Now, what we want to do is we only want the values of X of T at specific periodic intervals and basically throw away everything else. Okay. So that's the process of sampling. So what do we do in order to achieve that? Well, let's modulate, or essentially it's multiply, okay? Let's multiply this guy by something like S of T. And you might say, what the heck is S of T? Well, S of T is essentially equal to, okay, from N equals minus infinity to infinity, delta t minus n t. And so what this guy here is called, okay, he is referred to as an impulse train. And we'll be seeing this several times throughout this course. So the way he'll look like is essentially, if we look in a time domain, Right? And so here's zero, here's minus t, here's plus t, here's 2t, and so on and so forth, and minus 2t, and so on and so forth. So what happens is if we have here a continuous time signal, and let's so, suppose we have something that looks like this, the output of that, okay, if we look at it over there, what happens when we multiply deltas, okay, these delta values, there's zero in between, 
and uh, except for here, and uh, the amplitude of these guys are one, multiplied with this continuous time signal, what we get essentially is that. We, we, we get the envelope that looks like the original continuous time signal, but it's discretized because we only take values at 0, t, 2, t, 3, t, and so on, minus t, minus 2, t. However, this is just our discrete time signal. Okay? What we want to do is we want a digital signal. So what we do is now we take a quantizer. And you know, you can design these guys any which way. So let's say the transfer function of your quantizer looks like this. So what, what a quantizer does is that it takes a, the continuum of possible amplitude values and maps it to the nearest, um, nearest possible allowable amplitude value that's contained in, within the quantizer. And, and why do we do that? It's because what happens is, suppose you know people talk about, let's say, 14-bit quantizers or 16-bit quantizers. What does that mean? What these mean is that what happens when, if you have um, 14 bits, how many possible unique representations do you have? 2 to the 14. 16-bit quantizers, well, 2 to the 16. What this tells you is, the number of amplitude values that you can potentially assign your discrete time waveform. And what happens is as long as the amplitude value has a representation, um, we can translate that amplitude value into binary digits. So what we get at the end here is essentially a collection of ones and zeros that represent every time si uh, sample in terms of its quantized amplitude value translated into a sequence of ones and zeros. Okay. So that is the conversion, the end-to-end -end conversion from continuous time signal into a digital signal. Okay. Although it's great to see the time domain representation of a continuous time waveform being sampled and turned into a discrete time signal and then converted into a digital signal, uh, one would also like to see how this process would inf influence the frequency response of the continuous time signal. So in order to do that, we use the mathematical tool referred to as the continuous time Fourier transform, or the CTFT, in order to look at the frequency domain representation of the continuous time signal as it's being discretized. Okay? So um, there, here's the general continuous time Fourier transform pair below, but, but let, let's, let's take a step back. Physically, what does this mean? What do these expressions mean? Well, what the continuous time Fourier transform means is that we can represent any aperiodic time domain waveform in terms of the weighted sum of complex sinusoids, uh, 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 sinusoidal functions, okay? So complex sines and complex cosines, which in turn, they're, they're equivalent by Euler's relation to complex exponentials. So as a result, uh, when we have this representation, this is great because when we, we look at it graphically, we can see how we can uh, create uh, a time domain waveform in terms of this uh, weighted sum of complex exponentials. And several very important properties that we're going to be using uh, here and throughout the rest of this course are the following. Especially when you have convolution in time domain, it's actually the multiplication in the frequency domain and, and vice versa. We have the duality. When we have multiplication in time domain, it's convolution in frequency domain. And the all-important modulation. When we take a time domain waveform and multiply by complex exponential, what we get is a frequency shift in the frequency domain. And um, in addition to sort of sort of visualizing what's happening to that signal in the frequency domain, why do we uh, work in the frequency domain? Well, sometimes the mathematical operations, as well as the behavior of, of a signal, um, is just somewhat more tractable sometimes in the frequency domain than compared to the time domain. And that's why we usually uh, can work in either time or frequency domains.
So, um, what happens when we do have a continuous time signal and it's being sampled? Uh, so, what ends up happening? Well, remember um, the, 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 the work I just did in terms of using an impulse train and multiplying it, modulating it, if you will, against uh, the continuous time signal, uh, what we get is the discrete time version of that signal, and then afterwards we do the quantization in order to get a digital signal from it. Let's, let's, um, let's not look at a digital signal just quite yet. Let's just focus on that impulse train modulation of that continuous time signal to get a discrete time signal. How does that look like? Well, as we can see here, uh, X S of T, which is our impulse train modulated signal, uh, when we multiply the continuous time signal with that impulse train, what we get essentially are delta values multiplied at specific time instances against x c of t. And then anything else that that x c of t is multiplied against, if it's not uh, a delta, it's going to be zero. All right. So now let's take the Fourier transform of this, keeping in mind that multiplication in time domain is convolution in the frequency domain. What happens when you convolve um, a, a delta train against um, a frequency representation of, uh, of, of, um, of a continuous time uh, uh, signal? And what you end up getting, essentially, is these periodic replicas, if you will. So what we're essentially doing is, uh, when we convolve, what happens when you convolve a delta train against anything? What happens is you get periodic replica, periodic replica, periodic replica, periodic replica, and those replicas are occurring at intervals of omega s, the sampling frequency. So this is fantastic, because what this means is that uh, we have the, we, in, in our sampled signal, we potentially have the original continuous time signal in the frequency domain, just that it's also periodically being replicated across all frequencies. So this is great because if we ever want to convert it back into a continuous time signal, what would you do? You would filter out one of those replicas and you can reconstruct your continuous time signal. But we're but I'm jumping too far ahead. Let, let's 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 look at this uh, um, a little bit more closely, shall we? Um, so what happens is. Just like what I mentioned before, convolution with the impulse train creates these replicas at these pulse locations. And, um, uh, you know, what I mentioned before about being able to recreate from a single replica, if we can filter one out from the um, impulse train of replicas, um, there is a condition. If we sample too slowly and we have overlap between the replicas, all bets are off. What we get is something called aliasing. Essentially, those replicas start corrupting each other, and we cannot perfectly be able to recover or reconstruct that continuous time signal from its discrete um, uh, elements. And what happens is we have this minimum uh, frequency called omega n, and that's what we're going to call the Nyquist frequency. Okay, so let's represent. Um, um, do, do a little bit of um, um, this uh, frequency representation uh, of a continuous time waveform and what sampling does to its frequency response. So suppose we have the continuous time signal, but its frequency domain representation, xc of j omega. Okay, so this is the frequency domain. And suppose the spectrum of that signal, the frequency representation looks like a little triangle like here, and it's band limited. Um, okay, so now let's look at this guy. So suppose he's band limited to omega n over 2 and then minus omega n over 2. Okay, so this is a band limited signal. Now, what happens when we sample this guy? So as we've discovered mathematically, we should have periodic replicas every omega s. Okay, so we're going to have something that looks like this, something that looks like that, something that looks like that. Okay, and notice how 
there is no overlap because I intentionally chose omega s to be greater than omega n, right? So what happens is, um, suppose I wanted to reconstruct a continuous, continuous time signal from the discrete time signal, what would I do? I would use some sort of filter. It, I would extract one of these triangles. So we call these replicas. And from that, um, that would be essentially um, my continuous signal. Uh, what, how, does, how does this translate in the time domain? Well, when you filter out, especially if you use a low pass filter in this case, and you filter out a replica, what you're essentially doing is you're smoothing out and filling in uh, the gaps in between each one of the samples um, of your discrete time signal and thus recreating uh, your continuous time signal from that, okay? Um, and and that, that's, that, that's more of a digital signal processing um, um, concept uh, than, uh, than, than uh, what we're going to be using here in our, this course. Now, let's look at uh, the bad scenario when we have aliasing. So suppose I choose an omega s that is less than omega n, the Nyquist frequency. What do we get? So let's say I intentionally chose them to be really close together. Zero, omega s, two omega s. Um, minus omega s, minus 2 omega s. And then now we have our triangles, Ooh, and now they're overlapping. I'm, I'm sort of exaggerating the overlap, but you, 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 I guess you, you get my, uh, what I'm trying to say. This here, if you try and filter out one of the replicas to write, try and recreate your continuous time signal, you can't. Because what we have here is something called aliasing, and that's really bad news because with aliasing, um, you cannot perfectly reconstruct your continuous time signal from your uh, discrete time signal. Essentially, you're not sampling fast enough and information is getting corrupted. So that, that's what happens in the frequency domain when you uh, take a continuous time signal and sample it. So what we've just seen is what happens when you don't sample fast enough and you do not have enough information in order to recover um, a continuous time signal from its discrete time representation. And so we call that frequency um, omega n. We refer to that as the Nyquist frequency. And from the Nyquist frequency, this yields something called the Nyquist rate. And this Nyquist rate is actually quite critical, especially in applications such as uh, software-defined radio, because what we're trying to do is we're trying to take continuous time waveforms and signals from over the air and then bring them down to baseband frequencies, which is still analog, and then sample them. And what happens if we don't sample uh, at a sufficient rate? What ends up happening is uh, we corrupt our data, we have aliasing, and we're unable to properly decode the information from what it was intended to be in the first place at the receiver, and that introduces error and, 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 and thus uh, deteriorates the performance of our communication system. So what we want to do is we want to make sure that we're at least sampling at the Nyquist rate or uh, better, right? And so in or and, and by doing that, this will enable us to perfectly reconstruct any continuous time signal from a discrete time signal. Okay. So uh, let's zero in specifically on the USRP and how sampling is performed in it because um, in this course, if, if you can understand how the sampling and the, uh, the, sort of the uh, transmission path architecture is set up, the transmission, sorry, transmission path and reception path architectures are set up, um, you should be able to make quick work of the various digital communication algorithms and processes that you're going to need to implement afterwards. So you need to have a solid understanding of how sampling is performed on the USRP. So first, let's look at the receive path. So the receive path um, essentially contains uh, the following. We have four analog to digital converters and four digital down converters. So what does this mean? So the analog to digital converter is where the sampling occurs and the quantization of the information into a finite number of amplitude values that then gets translated into ones and zeros, right? Then what we want to do is, because we're going to have so many samples, remember that uh, the analog to digital converter has a 400 mega sample per second conversion rate, right? That we're sampling at that rate. Um, 
that might be just a bit too much information for um, your computer host to handle. So we have to we have to somehow um, uh, take out a good number of those samples, only keeping um, a select number um, that we can actually be able to process and and play with. Okay. So this is what we refer to as digital down conversion. It's the uh, decimation, if you will, of that information in a manner that we don't lose too much information in the process. So the signal processing that's performed on the receive path is essentially you go from the RF frequency, right, at in, on your RF daughter card, and through mixers and oscillators and filters and such, um, you go from the RF band to an IF, an intermediary frequency band, intermediate frequency band. And then from there, uh, several stages down, boom, 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 you go down to DC, to zero hertz. And that's where our sampling takes place, at DC, at zero hertz. And so we now use the analog to digital converter that, as we've seen, First of all, takes discrete time instances and then quantizes the amplitude values to a finite number of possible amplitude choices. Then the digital down converter throws away the majority of those samples, only keeping a select few. And that select few uh, of, the, of those samples are then fed into the USRP board, which is then packaged. Those ones and zeros are packaged into UDP packets that are then sent over the gigabit ethernet cable to the computer host um, and that information is then dumped into a software program such as Simulink and, 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 and that information is arranged in terms of in-phase and quadrature representation of the baseband signal. Okay. The transmit path is the exact uh, reciprocal of that of, of this um, of, the, uh, of, the, of the receive path. Um, we have the baseband IQ, we package it into UDP packets and send it by the gigabit ethernet cable to the USRP board. Um, uh, from the UDP, um, it is uh, rearranged and fed into something called the digital up converter. Essentially what the digital up converter does is it, it interpolates the data back to what the sampling rate of the digital to analog converter will be. So we go from whatever sort of uh, a data rate we have um, and, and then we up convert it to a rate that can be processed by the USRP when we convert from the digital domain back to the analog domain. So that's what the digital up conversion stage does. We then apply the digital to analog converter. So that's where you filter out a replica. Okay, And that filtering process essentially is you take your samples and the interpolation will um, introduce a lot more samples and you pass it through a filter that will smooth out those discrete time samples into a continuous waveform and then it goes into the RF front end to bring it back up to a radio, uh, very large radio frequency like 2.4 gigahertz. Okay. So now we're going to look at um, graphically how to do this um, uh, to transmit and receive paths on the USRP platform. So let's look at the receiver end of a USRP platform. How does this work? Well, we have an antenna and that antenna picks up the waveforms from over the air. And then we have the radio frequency front end, right? That's represented by our daughter card. From that guy. So it's connected by FMC connector into the um, USRP mother uh, motherboard or mother card. And the first thing that will happen to that signal is, so over here we have this signal at baseband or DC or zero hertz, right? The first thing that will happen is it will go through one of four possible analog to digital converters. And so we know that the analog to digital converter samples at 100 mega samples per second. Okay, so now given given that, um, what we get is that baseband continuous time waveform is now sampled, and now we get 100 mega samples per second coming at the output of that analog digital converter. Uh, with a, and this is a digital signal, not a discrete time signal. It's also quantized. However, 
that's a lot of information to be fed into uh, your computer host. And it might be a little bit taxing on the um, gigabit ethernet uh, cable that's connecting the host to the USRP platform. So what we need to do is pass it through the digital down converter. And what the digital down converter will essentially do is it will down sample by whatever your decimation factor is. So it will essentially produce a signal that will have a, the, or a, 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 a digital signal that has samples coming at mega samples per second, one mth the rate. Okay, and and so so this is actually really important because suppose you're debugging um, your digital communication system implementation using the USRP. Uh, unfortunately, what happens is the signal that you're receiving over the air. Uh, after it's uh, um, uh, sampled by your analog to digital converter, if you decimate, and usually folks use for like, let's say weak computer hosts, use something on the lines of like uh, 512 as a decimation factor, this could be problematic because you're throwing away 511 out of 512 samples every 512 samples. That's a lot of information. So debugging becomes very uh, uh, tricky because you're, you already don't have much of a perspective on what's going on. Once you get this downsampled information, um, as I mentioned before, you have four paths of this information. They basically go into an interleaver. And then into a buffer, a FIFO buffer, that then converts it into a UTP packet. Or packets, and that's the for, uh, that's sort of the uh, representation of the information as it's communicated then to your computer host using a gigabit Ethernet cable. And then at the other end, those packets, the information uh, using the libusrp library um, is extracted and then inserted into like either Simulink or GNU Radio or whatever software package, um, and that's where you do all your digital communication and digital signal processing algorithms and such. So this is the receiver. The transmitter is a little bit more complicated. Okay, so let me get another fresh piece of paper. It's almost the exact opposite, but a little bit different. So here's your computer host. You use libusrp in order to pack, uh, package all your information to UDP packets. It arrives, it gets converted into your digital information. And then what ends up happening is it's buffered. And de interleaved into one of four paths, we'll focus on one just for sake of simplicity. Okay. So the first thing that we do is we upsample by n and use a cascaded integrated comb filter. Uh, details of this are actually in your textbook and you should look at it. So the first thing we do is we increase the sampling rate of those guys. And the reason why we're doing it is essentially we want to bring um, the sampling rate ultimately before we hit the digital analog converter to its rate of 400 mega samples per second, because that's a fixed number. We have to bring whatever samples we have ultimately to that number before it gets converted into an analog waveform. Then we upsample by a factor of four and apply a bank of half band filters. And why do we do that? So, so we interpolate and we have the CIC filtering, and then we interpolate a little bit more by a factor of four and do the half band filtering. And we take one replica of that upsampling process and then pass it through the digital up conversion stage. And then that goes into your DAC, your digital to analog converter. And that, folks, is 400 mega samples per second. 
So that's four times the um, the the sample the sample sampling rate of your analog digital converter, and, and hence we have this uh, up sample by four. Okay. Then that gets fed into your RF front end, right? That goes from baseband to IF frequencies to RF frequencies, and then that's transmitted over antenna over the air. And so that, in a nutshell, is how your USRP transmits and receives information and is converted into um, uh, uh, analog waveforms from digital data.